Our final keynote for the day is by Rick Boothman. I'm sure he doesn't really need much of an introduction, but he is the former chief risk officer at the University of Michigan Health System. He basically pioneered this approach and he's been doing it for over 15 years now, so he's going to tell you what he, has, he thinks he has learned. So welcome, Rick. <laughs> thanks, Melinda. Um, and thanks for having me back despite my faux pas and bad things that I've done in the past. Um, in fact, I have two. Um, I have two disclaimers. Where do I advance this? Just hit the button. Oh. Okay. The first is this conflict of interest. I left the university in August of last year, after 17 years, preceded by that 21 years as a trial lawyer, in which I represented the University of Michigan. And I left because we were. I don't use the word culture so easily, but it was so embedded in the culture that it was time for me to to do other things. So I am helping other health systems, and some of what I have to tell you is self-serving today. The other apology I have is the same one that I give my wife on December 31st every year. I am very sorry for the things I've done in all the previous year and for all the things I'm about to do next year. <laughs> um, it was a happy accident that I was naive to the ways of a big organization. I had never worked in a big organization. So when I came to the university and it was serendipitous, I left private practice and told my partners, uh, I'll be back in two years. I have this idea, I'm gonna put it in place, it'll be, we'll get it up and running in two years and I'll be back. That was the explanation I gave to my wife. That took 17 years to do that. But um, uh, I was so naive, it never occurred to me to ask permission for things. Um, and that, I think, turned out well for me because um, some of the early lessons were like the first one. I didn't ask permission, but the caregivers resonated to this immediately. Now, I did have the benefit of being known at the university as one of our longest running defense trial lawyers. I didn't have to, they, they, they may have thought I had lost my sanity, but they didn't worry about my allegiance. And that was important, and it is important when you wade into this, and this will sound a little in, inconsistent with the other things that I've said today, but I think you have to pick a side when you're first starting, because you're walking into a highly um, adversarial environment, an, an environment in which people haven't known anything else. And if I had come into the university and said, I'm a patient advocate and I'm here to do the right thing, I think I would have lost everyone. Instead, what I said to our caregivers in that first year was I made 62 speeches and I got on every departmental meeting I could get on and I said to them, I am here for you always. And I'm here, more importantly, to reinforce the clinical mission. Knowing full well, of course, that by reinforcing the clinical mission, patients would benefit. But I said to them, I don't serve you well by defending care you're not proud of. I don't serve you well by protecting dangerous practices or dangerous caregivers, and I certainly don't serve you well by pushing you down the road to litigation. So in, as far as the short-term goal went, the message constantly was, we need to be honest as an investment in ourselves. We need to be honest and take control over this narrative in a brutally honest way if we have any hope of never doing this, whatever the this is, again. Um, I think that, was, that is an important lesson to be learned because it's too frequently I see when people enter health systems trying to set their own ethics way up here. When you're that obstetrician sitting worried that maybe you delayed a C-section a little too long and you just delivered a floppy uh, blue baby and you start to worry about the myriad concerns that come descending through your brain, everything from, oh my God, nobody else has made, ever made a mistake in the world, I don't have enough insurance, uh, I'll be held up to scorn, all of those things. I don't believe that you can start with this high-flown ethical thing. You have to start uh, believing that by reinforcing the truth and honesty and quality of that clinical mission, patients will benefit. Um, so. That was, <clears throat> I also wasn't bound by accepted divisions between risk and claims and safety. I didn't know anything about that. As a trial lawyer, I was always focused on the clinical content of every case. Uh, I had no idea about the political divisions, and it didn't occur to me until a couple years later that when I said the best risk management is to not make a mistake and the best, second best is to not do it again, 
I was stepping all over Quality's toes. But they never talked to each other. And it was the most mystical thing I'd ever seen, where how, how could you devote yourself to high quality healthcare and not learn all of the lessons that were coming from people who got hurt? Um, that was a surprise to me, and I was glad, frankly, that I didn't know about that ahead of time. Um, now you can't avoid uh, asking permission, but you can and must connect and resonate with the clinical staff. And I don't care what kind of clinical staff, it really resonates with physicians because physicians bear, I think, a disproportionate brunt of this so-called malpractice crisis. Usually when a nurse makes a mistake, the institution gets named, but often the nurse doesn't. That's not true for doctors, and I think doctors really need to know why you're doing this. The hardest part of this, and I've now worked with several health systems, the hardest part is mental, not operational. The hardest part is to say to that lawyer who is accustomed to working on claims, engaging um, his or her success by how much she was able to settle a case for, the hardest part is to say, you need to play a key and pivotal role in the accountability of our culture. You don't help anything if we hurt somebody and we dodge that bullet and walk away. So we have to see it differently as lawyers, and I think that that's really important. Uh, big lesson that I had to learn. Um, operationally, one of the biggest risks or biggest things to pay attention to are the embedded assassins. It's amazing how many people have a self-interest in maintaining the status quo, either because they're insecure and they're scared to death to make the wrong mistake, or they actually, like your defense lawyers, and I, I don't mean to castigate defense lawyers, I made a nice living at it myself, but they are only getting paid if they're billing hours. We need to think differently about our relationship with them. And, and I've done that at least in one, in one um, client that I'll describe a little bit later. Um, operational letter, uh, lessons and takeaways. Risk management is not valued, period, not valued. To the day I left the university, I fought with HR to get the salary structure where it needed to be. They kept benchmarking small community hospitals or risk management operations, which were little more than janitorial services. And I could never get them to understand that what our staff was doing was easily on par with the best defense lawyer workup in the world, only they were doing it in three months or two months or one month. And that, that really was hard to, to deal with that. We attracted a lot of staff who were dedicated and really um, committed to the mission of our risk management office. And to, to their credit, I suppose, they took less money than they deserved. But it's a hard job. It's a highly skilled job. And I never, ever uh, was able to break that. That was a problem to the, right to the day I left. The signal difference between the success and failure has to do with anchoring the mission. If you do not understand and remind your staff over and over why you're doing this, and you're not doing it because you want to compensate a sad story. You're not doing it because we like to think of ourselves as ethical. We're doing it because we will never improve and we will never spare our caregivers even the sad reality of this if we aren't honest with ourselves. That brutal honesty is important. So we had asked ourselves over and over again, why are we doing it? Does this help or hinder the mission? What happens when you have a patient who comes in and says, uh, or you realize that patient doesn't even realize they have a claim? We reached the point, and it may seem a little nutty, we reached the point where we compensated over 20 people who, didn't, who couldn't sue us, whose statute of limitations passed. But we had so believed at that point that we were investing in ourselves, and the vast crowd that witnesses all of these events would benefit from seeing an organization that didn't think it was a litigation game, that saw it really uh, as something that we needed to control for ourselves and for our, our long-term benefit. Training is on the job in these situations. Um, I wish there was a hospital uh, I could poach staff from. Um, we learned the hard way that we had to focus on key skills, skills that may not be completely honest, but I mean uh, obvious, but skills that things that they <laughs> get. <laughs> There's a Freudian slip. It's all a sham. <laughs> if you believe this, I've got some property for you. Uh, anyway, um, 
we had to focus on, on our staff's ability or the recruits' ability to really focus on, on the fundamental purpose for why we were there. Um, and that pleasing personality isn't helpful. I mean, you don't want somebody who doesn't care about those things. But when a staff doc comes in and starts ripping us, and they do all the time, starts ripping us about uh, how we're handling things, you have to constantly remind yourself, wait, what are the fundamental uh, underpinnings of this approach? And always look at the long term. Human beings are so short term focused. Um, and to be able to constantly keep our sights on the bigger picture was really important. We started recruiting for that. We wanted clinical skills because the whole key initially is was the care reasonable or not. That short circuited a lot of things. But to be able to get people who could communicate, who could write well, those sorts of things were really important to us. Um, and the consistency and the credibility within your medical staff is key. You lose that, you lose this. If you lose that credibility, if they begin to believe that, that you're just throwing them under the bus or whatever euphemism you want, you'll lose them. Lawyers are a bigger challenge than I realize, and I, it pains me to say this, but when I see my colleagues um, counsel hospitals who have fired a doctor to be dishonest when those inevitable requests for recommendations come in, when I see lawyers counsel hospitals to not engage in proactive peer review, when I see hospitals uh, or lawyers counsel hospitals as I did in Chicago last year to not participate in a patient safety organization because as she put it, the worst thing in the world that can happen is your words will get used against you in a court of law. When I see these things over and over, I realize as a profession, we are not wedded to the clinical mission we are sworn to support. We are instead wedded to an, an extreme view of worst case scenario, and then we start counseling against that. And lawyers, sadly, I think, have an outsized influence on the organization. I have yet to hear a doctor say to a lawyer, wait a minute, I'm a physician and a healer. It doesn't make sense to lie to that patient. It doesn't make sense to not tell the truth. It doesn't make sense to not go to the bedside. That's what I do, that's who I am. I never heard anybody say that to a lawyer. We need to stand up for that and we need to remind our legal colleagues, our insurance colleagues who are very important to us that they need to conform their advice to support the clinical mission, not to be <coughs> adverse to it and injure it. We have done far more harm protecting dangerous caregivers in peer review threats of, of litigation and things like that than we realize, and I think that that's something we need to look at as a profession. So I want to talk about the University of Minnesota Physicians Group. At the University of Minnesota, they don't own their own hospital. In the 80s, they sold their hospital. The UMP, the Physicians Group, moved off uh, the university uh, payroll and formed their own corporate group but the university still uh, hires and owns its trainees. When they get sued, they hire three lawyers to protect three pots of money. On paper, this should have been a complete failure. I was hired, and I'm, they, they approved my telling you this story, I was hired by only the physicians group who said we don't have control over incident reporting, we don't have control over even the patient at the bedside, we don't know how we can, but we are really committed as a caregiver group to do this. It should have failed and instead it's been a wonderful success uh, actually in the short term. Um, and they also did other environments. So they were in multiple hospitals, not just one hospital group. All of their partners were skeptical. Nobody said no. Some of them even said we're already doing it when they think that all they were doing was selectively settling a case here and there is the it. But every one of them was skeptical in some way and were, uh, were difficult. But we instead said, no, we can pull this off. And the statute of limitations in Minnesota is four years. When I looked at their claims history alone, the average from the occurrence to the resolution of a lawsuit at some point was in excess of six years. You imagine that's an eternity hanging over your head if you're an injured patient or you're a caregiver worrying about it. So we met the organizational fear head on. Um, 
we, the first thing we did was clarify the goals and have to say this over and over and over with the leadership. Here's why we're doing it. Is it helpful to you to, to reduce your claims cost but protect uh, 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 dangerous people or dangerous practices? We were very motivated and as it turned out, I think it was, uh, I didn't think it was initially, but it was actually a benefit to have a care provider group as a client rather than the whole uh, uh, the whole um, uh, uh, group because they understood and it resonated with them uh, right from the beginning. We started by mapping their present state and inventorying their resources. Uh, you heard Michelle Mello say only the University of Michigan doesn't believe, she means me, doesn't believe that you have to add a lot of resources to do that. I think you can do it tomorrow. And it starts with mental resolve to say when that new case comes in, we're going to handle it differently. We're going to get to that patient, we're going to embrace the caregivers, and then we're going to stabilize that clinical situation and we're going to treat it honestly from there. You don't need more resources to do that. You need, you have all the pieces in place, but you have to repurpose them. At the University of Minnesota Physicians Group, they had a skeleton uh, risk management staff. We did not add a single person in the first year. But we recruited the defense firm and we sat down, we had four defense firms. I sat down with all four, three were hostile to me, but one said, you know, this kind of makes sense. And we sat down and we said, can you envision a different world? Can you mobilize in a week or in a couple of days when we get an unexpected event in? Can you help with the investigation because we have no internal resources to do that? Can you get us expert reviews? Can you see your way to an assignment that may last no more than 30 or 60 days? And we're actually talking to them now about a completely different pay structure. Not one that, that, that rewards hours churned, but one that rewards value uh, on the case. And that's not easy, but we're gonna pull that off. They were on board, like, and it's been wonderful. We created handoffs and triages, and we worked very carefully in that, um, in that uh, workflow so that everybody was on board and we will probably, instead of building this out internally, we will probably keep them as, part, as an integral part of this. We also had to set the proper metrics. If your metric is lowering my malpractice cost, then you will be tempted to cheat someone or you will be tempted to put your head down and hope that somebody doesn't know they have a claim. Or you will be tempted not to talk to that patient who has an injury not worth half a million dollars, which seems to be the threshold now, at least in the, uh, the uh, Detroit area, half a million dollars before a lawyer will even talk to you. So you've got to get your metrics. Your metrics reflect your priorities, and your priorities have got to reflect something bigger than, than driving your costs down. We worked with, in terms of the metrics, they did not have good metric, uh, uh, good data analytics. What they did have was a contract with a commercial risk management group that would just produce a year-end report on their claims every year. They were excited to expand the list of metrics once we sat down and educated them, and they're doing it for nothing. They think they're going to be out at the forefront of this from a commercial perspective, and I'm happy to let them believe that. We started in February, we started in January and February really by September they had already done more than 40 cases and this is a, an organization again that didn't own its own hospital, didn't have a big elaborate um, uh, uh, bunch of resources and didn't add a single FTE. But what are the takeaways and Michelle mentioned this. I had the luxury of dealing with three unbelievably committed clinical and risk management people. Barbara Gold is an anesthesiologist at the University of Minnesota Physicians Group, and she got it immediately. They came to Michigan, they looked at our system, they watched our committee meetings, they, they interviewed all of our staff, and they have been on this from day one and never wavering. It's been wonderful. Ruth Flynn, the lawyer who's the general counsel who's in charge, and Nancy Lemo have been uh, just stalwarts, and you can't do it without folks like that. You have got to have a corporate leader uh, in the bunch. Um, corporate level support requires a leap of faith. CEOs, CMOs will understand it intellectually. Until they actually see it, it never really sinks in, and you've got to find a way to keep reinforcing them because they're going to get cornered by somebody influential in the community who will have some crazy idea of what you're doing, like I did when 
when the Trinity or the, um, uh, I forget what they were called at the time, the other group in town went to the regents of the university and said, this guy's crazy and he's sleeping with the enemy. You better, he's a, he, he, is, uh, he is really a loose cannon. You've got a plan for that because it will happen. Um, as I said, it was uh, advantageous that we had a physician's group uh, because it all res resonated with them. And the other thing uh, that we did that I thought was pretty smart was look at their employee satisfaction over 10 years and their staff docs uh, attitudes and surveys of safety and those sorts of things. We realized that they felt there was no true leadership. What is missing in this, most people's understanding of this model is the sense of control that you have. Instead of waiting and cowering and waiting for a claim, to just charge out there once you're sure of yourself and you're sure of your mission is very empowering. That takes some doing and takes some repeating a lot. What did we learn uh, with skeptical corporate partners? This model lifts all boats. All of a sudden, uh, the other parties are interested. They want to know my, my latest uh, phone call is from the hospital system that wants to know what it will take to get them in line. They had to watch UMP do this for the first year, but it was amazing to see that. So next stage is honing the operational phase. We are now, we have now mapped out in great detail the expectations of what happens from the event all the way through, who's doing what, what is the division of labor, but always with the question of why. Why are you doing this? Why is this important? Always reconnecting that way. And communication becomes uh, more and more important. So let me uh, jump ahead. Um, because I've had some failures, I have a client who uh, called and said they have um, sticker shock and they're appalled because they, I didn't do a good job of letting them understand that it's all front loaded. With the University of Minnesota Physicians Group, the bill was quite high in that first year. It was uh, fairly intensive. They're basically on their own and we're doing now weekly coaching or bi-weekly coaching. But let me uh, remind everybody um, why we do this. You can look at, I think the slides are in their packets. Yeah, slides are available. But I'm running out of time as usual. <laughs> so why we do this? I got a phone call um, in July and here was the call. We had just begun the earliest operational phase and the call was we just had a 52 year old man with a spine surgery. He had a complex spine situation. Everything seemed to go well and he woke up a paraplegic. What do we do? I said, well, go to his bedside and immediately engage that. Next call, it's too late. He's already castigated the surgeons. He has ripped everybody uh, one side down the other. He's gonna sue everyone. It was really bad and he doesn't wanna talk to anybody. I said, fine, then get the investigation done. Within two weeks, they knew that there was really no malpractice in that case. The surgery went fine, but what had happened to this uh, patient was he had clotted off some serious blood vessels in his spine, probably related to the fluctuation in uh, perfusion during the anesthesia induction, but that, that was unavoidable and it was seemingly undetectable at the time. Their conclusion was we didn't do anything wrong. So they called me up. Historically, they would have parked that on a shelf and waited four years or waited until a claim came. I said, okay, next step, um, call the guy back. They called back and said he's got a lawyer and she happens to be the most aggressive lawyer in our town. I said, then fine, call her up and say, we realize you've asked for records already. Uh, if you're gonna take this case, we would love to work with you. In fact, we've already investigated this. We'd ha be happy to share all this with you. And they said, no. Are you kidding? We're not gonna do that. I said, it gives you a sense of control over that narrative, let her know. So they drafted a letter, and the first letter they drafted was extremely defensive. It was basically, you don't have a case, we're this, we're that. And we changed it dramatically to say, we have looked at this carefully and we really welcome your input because we never want this to happen to anybody else. And for the life of us, we cannot find what we would have done differently we don't think we made a mistake, but we really want to know. And that's the way that letter went out. They got a return phone call and it was as histrionic as you might think. It was basically, I'm going to rip your heart out. We're going to be the biggest verdict in this city. It went on and on and on. And they called me up and said, I think we made a terrible mistake. We should never have done this. 
I said, no, share, they had one or two expert reviews left. I said, share those reviews with her, with her and again, <clears throat> welcome feedback. That was the end of July, beginning of August. At the end of September, I got a phone call and it was the risk manager who said, let me read you this letter. They had gotten a letter from the lawyer and the letter said, thank you so much for sharing your investigation and sharing your expert opinions. I've had it thoroughly reviewed and my experts agree with all of your experts. I have counseled the client that I'm not taking this case. I have counseled him that he can get another lawyer. And the truth is we have only one request. He would like to see the two surgeons and apologize. He would like to say to them, he is so sorry he fired them and he would ask them to take him back. Isn't that remarkable? Why do we do this? It's not a, a case in that situation that ended in compensation. We can't compensate every sad story. Medicine is inherently risky and you can't control the risks. But what a sense of peace it brought to that man. I then got a letter from the two surgeons who said, I have been, we have been down this rodeo before, that's the way it started. And the last few times it hung over our heads for t one, 10 years. They said, I can't thank you enough for allowing us to have a voice in this and be heard before there was a claim. That's why we're doing this, to be able to glean whatever lessons we can and speed that acceleration, but also on the human short-term end. All of these people who are, it's so humbling to watch this human drama play out, but to be able to say to them, that explanation, that sense of caring, that business of we're still here with you even though it didn't go well at bedside when, when he screamed at his two doctors, I don't blame him, I have no idea how I would behave. But to be able to show that compassion and stay with the medical mission is all of it. So thank you very much for listening to me year after year. I'm sorry I blather on and on. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them now or later. Thanks. So thank you and uh, good afternoon. I'm Ashley Yates. I'm the, um, I currently hold the baton as the chair of Macrame and I'm uh, thrilled uh, to have been in this role since 2012 when Ken Sands at BIDMC asked me to um, get involved in this, uh, this CRP thing, uh, which was how it was uh, received by me at the time. I was about one month into the role of being chief medical officer. And I have to say nine years later, uh, this is probably the most rewarding thing I've done in my career. Um, Guilty, afraid, and alone. Um, that was 2007. I'm not sure if Seagal's in the room uh, or not. She is, there she is. Um, that came to my mind when we were talking with our, our patients uh, earlier in the panel discussion, uh, and they talked about uh, the guilt that they felt. Uh, maybe they should have said something differently. Maybe they should have done something differently with their family member. Um, I think you know that you're doing this program. Um, as part of the culture and fabric of your organization uh, when you are um, overcome uh, with emotion uh, in meeting with these patients. Uh, I am from a small institution. Um, the comment that uh, Michelle made uh, may very well have come from uh, my hospital. Uh, and being in a small institution and wearing a lot of hats, I oversee risk, I oversee uh, safety, I oversee healthcare quality, um, and, I, uh, and, I, and, I, and I lead the medical staff. Um, and it is about uh, peer support, uh, and it is about doing the right thing for our patients. Um, and I think it's about being able to sit there and hold the pain and the grief and the sadness, um, not only of the patients, but of the providers. Um, and so uh, we talked in the, in the gray case about the, um, the, the outcomes, uh, and, and the outcome is actually sitting there and holding that pain uh, for people. Uh, and as the leaders that you all are in this room, you will hold a lot of people's pain uh, as you go through this. Um, but at the, at the end of those events, in two very contrasting cases, the case where there was a clear error uh, and the case that was gray, um, I think you know you've done the right thing when everybody at the uh, end of that meeting leaves the room feeling just a little bit better, uh, even uh, though we realize that feeling better doesn't always make, mean bringing somebody back. Um, and it doesn't uh, always mean being able to undo uh, a mistake uh, or, or say that, that uh, there's nothing we, we, we would have done differently. Um, so at the end of the day, this is about trust and it's about transparency and it's about authenticity. Um, I want to thank the panel today, uh, both panels that presented. I want to thank all of the people that 
have supported this uh, since uh, Alan first started leading this charge uh, back in the, uh, the early 2000s with, uh, with Ken Sands and others who were in the room. Um, I have, uh, I have um, some, some things bulleted on the, uh, the wall in my office uh, and their qualities, I think, of, of leadership, um, perseverance, uh, commitment to excellence. Um, I have patience written there, and ironically, um, I, I've obviously pressed a lot, lot harder on the magic marker when I wrote patience, because it, it, it sort of spread the felt, and it, 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 it's bigger. I'm not a very patient person. And this takes courage. Um, so, uh, so, per, so persist. Um, please join Mac or me. This is an opportunity. Uh, I think uh, Melinda uh, mentioned at the beginning of the, this morning that the, uh, the article is available for download on the, on the website, if, you're, uh, if you go to the website and, and download it. We, we have been, um, this is messy work. Uh, there is a group of providers and caregivers uh, and insurers and attorneys uh, and, 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 and advocates of patients that have sat around a table together now for almost a decade. decade. Um, we've been through all of the mess and the nitty gritty of this and we are offering ourselves out there as Macrame to support you uh, and help you through that. Um, so please, uh, please take advantage of it. Um, I want to thank uh, Covaris uh, Community Health Foundation for sponsoring uh, today's event. Um, I want to thank two medical students from uh, Harvard Medical School uh, who led a charge with Mass Medical Society and thank you uh, MMS for, for this event today and, and this venue. Um, to pass a resolution uh, that uh, Mass Medical Society will support uh, care programs uh, and will also support peer support, which I think is the other hand uh, to this. So thank you uh, to MMS. Um, I, uh, I really have to thank Melinda. Uh, Melinda, you're the, you're the wind beneath the wings of this program. You did a phenomenal job today, as you have all the way along. And I, I really think what was missing on, on uh, Michelle's list is, is uh, Melinda is probably one of the yes. single most important yes. reasons uh, why this program has been so successful in Massachusetts. <laughs> Please join us for, uh, for lunch uh, in the lobby and, and networking. Uh, the MACRA members all have red dots on their uh, name badges, and we're happy to, to take questions or, or hear your reflections on what you've been through. Have a wonderful day.